All right. What's going on, everybody? I'm Chris Castellani here with uh, one of my favorite uh, channels uh, on YouTube, Alex Hunter, a.k.a. High Top Films, a man who has accumulated over 323,000 subscribers. How's that sound to you, man? Does that seem like that? <laughs> does it seem like that a lot? That scares to you? me, man. That scares me. Like <laughs> That's, dude, even today, that's why I don't check the numbers, man. It feels overwhelming to a certain point, but um, yeah. this, this is a guy, you've probably seen him before. You know, his videos have picked up a ton of traction, especially over the last several years, and um, I'm happy to have him on here uh, interviewing him for my channel today. Alex, uh, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing fine today. You know, I woke up a little earlier for me because usually I'm a nocturnal animal. I don't go to bed till like six in the morning because I like to write at night when no one's awake kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I actually uh, managed to wake up early today, you know, went on a nice walk. It's nice here in Pittsburgh right now. So like doing all right, man. How about you? I'm doing all right. Were you were you born and raised in Pittsburgh? Was Is that your, yes. your main site? Right on. Yes. Uh well, uh, we'll, we'll just jump right into it because I, I know you're a busy guy. And, and, and I said before we started recording, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to avoid a ton of Spider-Man questions because I feel like that's you get asked that a bunch. But this is the, this is the main one uh, kind of in terms of what you're known for that I wanted to ask. And um, sure, man. You, know, you, you have become and I don't think this was purposeful on your part, but you have Probably become not. kind of the, the poster boy for for Spider-Man MCU hate. You know, I, and I watch I watch all your videos and what's frustrating, uh, I feel like uh, to a certain extent is I think that you've put out stuff that's more thought provoking than that. I think you've put out stuff that's better than that. And yet the kind of, when people hear about your videos or hear about your channel, that's kind of what they come back around to. Um, have you tried to embrace that or are you, are you tired of kind of being that guy? Um, I feel like it's, I like to meme myself along with it. Like all the broke me memes or like bad Spider-Man movie memes. Like they're very funny, but you're totally right. It's very strange to me that people associate me as being like uber negative and uber, uber critical when uh, I think it's just because like my most popular videos are the MCU Spider-Man ones, which the first one, it's really funny, like the homecoming one, I think I made when I was like freshly 18 years old and I'm now 22. I think I was maybe 18 or 19, but that's like years ago. And I've grown so much as a creator and the way I look at art is so different. And the, the far from home broke me one. I made that literally within a day after seeing the movie. So like you said, there are like the, the longer form videos that I'm really proud of, like Batman Forever, or the Iron Man videos, or you know what I mean? Or the Begins, the Nolan movies. Um, and so it's, it's weird that I'm associated, I'm like, um, I'm considered the negative Nancy of, the, of the, the, the crowd when honestly, it's like, I feel like probably more than 70% of my videos overall are positive, like <laughs> right. thing about things I love. But I like to embrace it in the meme sense because like, you know, and no publicity is bad publicity per se. So I like to I like to play around and have some fun with it. And, and that's what you put out a couple of days ago where you're like, look, I just to the people who are hating on it, like I'm able to fund my short films because yeah. people are people are throwing, you know, heaping you know piles of shit at me because I have an opinion on a movie that they might not agree with. Oh, it's uh, funny because the, the Shang-Chi video is actually like if you watched it, I don't know if you have it's. Uh, yeah, I did. It's actually like a positive, like most of it's like, hey, these artists are cool artists. Here's what they've done. Like their work is amazing. I, this just wasn't for me because of, you know, the, the Marvel formula is a little stale to me. Um, so it was really, it was kind of just an entertaining day to just get like jumped at like, oh, he hates the movie. You know, he fucking mm -hmm. despises it. And I'm like, I really didn't hate it at all. Right. You know, like I just thought it was funny. And I was not crazy about Shang-Chi either. In fact, yeah. and this is coming from somebody who's a big fan of the MCU, but I think we kind of shit, we were kind of in lockstep about that where, I appreciated it for what it was. And, yeah. and, and the one thing you, you go out of your way to say is like, there's, I, I don't dislike anybody who enjoys it. In fact, I'm yeah. really glad that people are embracing it. Um, but I'm, I'm with you in the sense that the one problem I had with it is I just felt like, unlike a lot of other Marvel movies, I didn't think the pacing was particularly good. I felt like there's a yeah. huge part in the second act where it really drags. Um, and even like a, a lot of the other, we, like Black Widow was whatever to me, but I felt like at least at, it moved at a reasonable enough clip. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, no, I mean, it's it's one of those things where you, you pop off for a certain thing and that's it's got to be frustrating to a certain extent, because like I said, I've seen all your videos and, and I know that you've made better stuff. And one of those things that I think is better, um, and this will be the last Spider-Man question, though, it's, it's not good. MCU related. My favorite video of yours was Mark Webb's kind of amazing Spider-Man. I listened to that entire video while on a walk, like a 45 minute walk, oh, and, nice. and I came back, I came back um, and, and it. I'm not ashamed to admit that that video made me a little bit emotional. And part of it was like, it was June, 2020. We were in the heart of COVID. And, and but I think you tapped into something with that video that um, rarely gets tapped into on the internet, which is that like, 
we deal in extremes on the internet. The best video essays are about movies that everyone hates or about movies everyone loves. The most popular political pundits are far left wing or far right wing. I mean, there's very little, you know, kind of gray area there. But you made a video about a movie that you and I both acknowledge is remarkably flawed. And yet I think it's the prime example of, man, there's a great movie in here somewhere. And I, I could tell the passion with every sentence, everything you said. Was that, you know, how just how proud of you, how proud were you of the final product and the way that thing came out? Oh, man, I remember clearly editing that one because it was such a big undertaking to do. Yeah. And that was like one of the not one of the first long form videos I did, but it was it was definitely I think it's the longest video I've ever made. Maybe the Batman Forever one's a little longer or the Raimi Spider-Man 3 one. But um, I just remember editing that and day after day and like worried that it wasn't going to come together. And there's that part where I really wanted the emotion to hit, which is like I the the crane scene in that movie. Right. Which I love that scene. And where I talk about how it's like really just an ultimate symbol of like the working class superhero and how like the working class people save Peter Parker. Um, I was so worried that would come across. So a word used to describe me a lot pretentious and so devoid of like the emotion I was going for. So when I finished it, the, when I finished the rough cut of it and exported the whole thing and was watching it and was like, ah, this actually like emotionally hits me and I made it. So I hope it like impacts other people. And that's, that's the number one thing that's, I think the, to me, it's always the test of whether or not I succeeded as an artist and a creator is like, um, if, if people are feeling things, like you said, they wouldn't usually feel when watching a, a YouTube video where it's not just vitriol or like overwhelming praise or overwhelming hate, there's like a nuance to it. But the mo- most important thing to me is that they feel an emotion. You know what I mean? Like you, you said you're on a walk and you got a little emotional towards the end. Like that, that's everything to me mm-hmm. because the YouTube videos, people don't really go for emotion that hard in YouTube videos. Mostly it's just people trying to be super analytical and smart. And I was like, I just want to make you cry, man. That's my, that's my <laughs> goal. You know, like, you know, you know what the thing about that video that moved me is it, it was the amount of time you spent on Andrew Garfield to me, who I feel like, you know, it's weird is some actors will take on a role and it will propel their career to another, like Chris Hemsworth, like he's Thor, right. And he became a star because of Thor. And yet sometimes you have an Andrew Garfield who did nothing wrong and played that role the way it was probably took it above and beyond what was on the written page. Yeah. And yet I feel like has been done pretty, pretty poorly by Hollywood. And if there's one thing I'm excited about in 2021, the next three months, he's got Assuming he's in uh, No Way Home, which whether or not he, I think he is, but regardless of that. Pretty, he, pretty sure he, he is too. Yeah, he, but regardless of that, he's in TikTok Boom, which which he's the lead, he's in Eyes of Tammy Faye. It, it yeah. excites me to see that he's, this is a guy who I feel like of the three actors who have played Spider-Man, had the best gauge on what that character actually was, and yet had the hardest time translating it to the big screen because of uh, of studio interference. And yeah. it's, it's, uh, I think that you've done a great job with a lot of your videos of tapping into like a director's intent uh, and, mm-hmm. and you've had films that have got kind of gotten in the way of that because of the studio. And I, I loved your video about Batman forever. And I think it was honest trailers that said that it's the worst movie that everyone's seen 30 times. And, yeah. and that's, that's a perfect way to describe it because the one thing about Batman forever, it looks gorgeous. It's a well-directed movie. I mean, it's a really it's a, like pretty sure it got Oscar nominated for a uh, best cinematography that year. I think and it, was it like, deserves it. Was, it. It got three nominations. I think it was like yeah. best cinematography, best sa- and a couple sound like technical awards. Yeah. But I really loved the story you told at the end about Joel Schumacher because I, I and, and that was another moment that really moved me because it Joel Schumacher was railroaded by Hollywood after Batman Forever or I'm sorry, but after Batman and Robin. And, and despite that, and it's why like after he died, I was I was actually happy to see that there was a little bit of reverence and, and kind of reflection. Jim Carrey put out a really beautiful statement about him because it seemed like he developed a reputation for being one of the more generous, you know, people like kind hearted guys in Hollywood. And, and that, that, that does matter. And I'm just curious when you, what was the inspiration for you to make that video? Was it, I want to make a video about Batman forever, or was it, I want to do a video that's an homage to Joel Schumacher that uses one of his more popular films as kind of a it backdrop. Was, it, it was definitely a mix of both because everything in that video, about in the openings true, like it was my favorite movie as a kid. Like it probably yeah. was so many people's. Um, and I've been obsessed with like the Schumacher cut for years because it's been like, I remember being like a fucking 14 year old kid going on the internet, going on forums and like seeing the the giant bat deleted scene mm-hmm. and being like, oh, where's this movie? Like, where's this movie? Yeah. This looks so cool. 
Um, and I was like, not too many people like, and not too many people talk about that cut. They talk about the Snyder cut. They talk about the A or cut, you know, and I'm glad those, my, I mean, I'm glad the Snyder cut got released and I'm hoping that the A or cut gets released because I'm all for director's visions, no matter what. But like, and I was like, yeah, Joel just gets so much needless hate and, 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 you know, vitriol spewed at him on the daily basis because he just made like the, the most fun campy Batman movie he could, but it also had a soul. It had the really, really strong soul about being like isolated and torn and split. And like the fact that the studio cut it out, most of it out. And the fact that he's just known as like the goofy guy who like, you know, made Batman very gay, you know, like that's, it's so, it, it ignores all the artistry and all the passion he put into it. So I wanted to make a video on Batman forever to answer your question. And I also wanted to, you know, be like, Hey, Joel Schumacher was a super talented artist that did the best he could with Batman. And all the hate that got spewed at him for years is so, so needlessly, you know, kind of horrible. Yeah, and it's I've always respected him for it because like it Batman and Robin was a Frankenstein's monster of a studio film that, that came yeah. together because a whole lot of people felt like they need to kind of dip their hands in the pot. And, and Joel Schumacher, there's, you know, there's a very you know famous kind of behind the scenes moment where he talks about the making of, of that movie and what happened. And I. Uh, he says, look, it was it was kind of a toy commercial. They wanted it to be. I think the word he used was toyetic. Toyetic, um, yeah. Yeah. And um, but he, in fairness to him, he said, look, uh, the movie didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. But I was also an adult. I was also remarkably present during the whole process. Like, I'm not yeah. going to sit here and say, hey, it's the studio's fault because they 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 pulled a 50 year old man in a million different directions. I mean, that was on me. And, and I still like as as ugly as that movie is and as bad as it is, I. I think to deny that he wasn't like a talented filmmaker is just wrong. I mean, he made a lot of really good movies and really you look at kind of the track record he had in the late eighties, building up to the nineties, he was a perfect choice to direct on yeah. the, the kind of the next installment of a Batman movie. I mean, he, he was one of the few directors that really had an honest visual style to him. So it's like, if you're going to make a Batman movie following kind of the darkness that was Batman returns, he was kind of a perfect choice. Now, what the studio did with it, you know, it's 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 unfortunate. But you know, I was I really appreciate what you did uh, at the end of that video. And I, I was I was it honestly moved me that you were that you had kind of that personal connection. Yeah, that really weird circle of life thing. Yeah, which I um, didn't know about for a long time. But now you you make a bunch of video essays, and those are those are the ones that you know those are your most popular videos. But I wanted to ask you, you made a short film about a year ago now called the plumber. And first oh, of yes. all, kind of a yes or no question here. Uh, does it feel like a year ago? Almost? No, dude. I mean, so much has happened since yeah. like, but uh, no, no, I still, I still am like obsessed with that movie. I'm still, I still feel like we're making it in a lot of ways. So like, I wish I could hear, hold on. I literally have like the plumber's suit hung up on this door and I have his little snake like yeah uh, like on this door in my room much like your video essays I could tell the passion was there and you know that I thought visually the thing the thing looked great but the one question I've always wanted to ask you is as a guy who's made video essays about guys in capes so why why a plumber what was it with the plumber profession that made you say you know I think I can have a kind of a creative angle to this profession well, I just was like, one day I was sitting here, I was, I was probably stoned to be completely transparent. <laughs> uh, one day I was sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking my buddy, Francesco played the plumber texts yeah. me is like, Hey, for this like acting competition I'm doing, they want like a monologue. Like I thought everyone's going to do Shakespeare. Like, can you write me a monologue? And I've been toying with this idea for a while of like how bad plumbers have it and how like yeah. shit, you know, pun intended, right. Like they, they, like all the stuff they do for everyone and they 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 get to like <laughs> to get really gross they get to smell and sometimes touch the like really intimate yeah. private parts of a person you know what i'm yeah. saying like yeah your toilets pretty knows you a lot better than a lot of people do you know what i mean for sure so i was like i was like what if this guy viewed himself as a superhero like what if he was completely deranged and mm. so angry at a society who who neglects his profession but his way to cope with it was to view himself as a superhero. And then also, what if he was a, what if he was a murderer too? What if, what if he, what if what he perceived to be filth, he cleaned it up and it's all a part of the job, you know? Yeah. And that was just like a crazy idea. And then we we're like, you know, we could make this like during COVID in a few locations and just have a guy talk to the camera Ferris Bueller style mm -hmm. and make it real creepy. And that was our, and, and funny because I, I liked, we tried to make it a dark comedy. Right. I saw what you were doing with it. And I saw the intent of the director. Were you frustrated by the number of people who maybe uh, were expecting something different from uh, what you, than what, what I was created? The, what I was really, I mean, the, the movie won 
not one, but it was number seventh highest ranked short film on Letterboxd, mm -hmm. like of the year, which was crazy because like David Sandberg, who did Lights Out and Shazam, yeah, yeah. we were ahead of his shorts in the in the Letterboxd user rating. So I think like a lot of people loved it. But the comments that really got to me weren't really about what me and John did behind the camera. It was a lot about what um, Francesco did, where they're like, oh, he's overacting. And it was so and it, that that irked me so much because I was like, no, no, any any time Cheska would take it here, I'd be like, no, bring it here. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It, that would that was like completely intentional. So the people who are like, oh, the performance is bad. It's so over the top. I'm like, no, you can think the movies but you can not like the over the topness of the movie. Right. But like, do not direct that towards, you know, the actor who's also one of my best friends. So that was the stuff that irked me a little bit. But also, I'm just happy when people interact with the the actual films we make you know because that's the passion that's the that's the number one goal is to to do that for a living you know for sure yeah and i before you know i wanted i want to do a bit of a deep dive in, into you you know as a person and some of the things you've talked about publicly sure. on social media but before i do that i wanted to ask you about something you said in one of your recent videos now i i i have not watched the show superman and lois um yeah. i'm i'm rooting for it because i'll be honest i am um to say I'm not a fan of some of the recent live action interpretations of Superman, I think is kind of an, and Batman is a bit of an understatement. I understand uh, fully, man. Right. But you had a, you had a quote at the end of that episode and I'll, I'll read it off here that I found, you know, sometimes you just hear something from somebody that feels like they're reading it straight from like, they take the words out of your brain and put mm -hmm. it. And I found it startlingly relatable kind of given where I was in my own life. And that was that love is hard, man. Loving is hard. Love is trying to have forgiveness for the unforgivable. It's attempting empathy for apathy. Wishing the best when we've done the worst. It's the most horrifying, all-consuming coldness and the greatest uh, indescribable, unshakable warmth. Where does that perspective come from for well, you? Like, is that this just- is a, a, This is an exclusive first yeah. time First time talking about it. I appreciate that. Thank you. I was, I was with um, someone for four years and it was my first big, big love. Um, and that, that, you know, sadly we separated at the beginning of the summer this year. And I still will always hold such like a place of love and, you know, compassion for her in my heart. She was there at the beginning of the YouTube video. She's been in a lot of the short films mm -hmm. and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to talk about Superman and Lois because that show was hitting me. Like it was, I was feeling the, the tangible loving relationship between Clark and Lois as my relationship was ending. And so for me, it, I just wanted to make kind of like an ode to love and an ode to her and an ode to just like the, 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 like a, the unshakable warmth you feel when you love someone and the horrifying coldness you can feel when you love someone. So that was like, in a lot of ways, the Superman Lois video is the most personal without just being, I think I yeah. tweeted, I joked about it one time where I was like, someone's like, wow, man, did you get your heart broken or something? I like retweeted it with like, you have no idea. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? Like there was a, there was a similar kind of uh, emotion that, that I took yeah. out of it too. And I, I appreciate you being open. Yeah, I had man. a feeling. Yeah, just to what based on kind of the 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 way that you'd gone about tweeting stuff and, and the way that you were creating some of your content that that was that might have been kind of what you were leaning towards. And I, I thought the ending to that video was was really beautiful. And and kind of transitioning to that, you know, I wanted to ask you about you know your mental health and you've been very open. Yeah, uh, about course. your struggles and and I've always I had a, I have a question I've always wanted to ask a creator at, at some point. It's it. something I've kind of related to since I got my job at Barstool, and that's. Is it easier or harder to deal with something like anxiety and depression now that you've reached a certain level of notoriety? Do you feel like you have a more effective support system because of your audience or does it feel kind of overwhelming sometimes and you want to just you know, shrink? Uh, I, I would say it's both. It's like yeah. the, the positivity element of it comes from when I can just tweet out like, hey guys, I'm not going to make something for a month because I'm depressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. And then I get like overwhelming love. Like that's great. But at the same time, there is the pressure, especially just to, you know, basically just show up to work to do it, you know, pay the bills to, to make the make the videos, make our films. And that pressure, I, I never I'm a, I'm a younger guy. You know, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm 26. Like, oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. So we're around the same. Age. Right. No, but, we, we know. We know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so like when I was like when I started it, when I, I was just like a kid, kid, man, for straight out of high school, didn't go to college and instead did this. So like. I, I did it as a hobby and I did it to express myself. And now there's the expectation that I'll always be doing it, that I'll always do it. And if I don't, I'll disappear. And if I don't, I won't be relevant. And like mm -hmm. the struggle for relevancy while also dealing with mental health struggles, that's the tricky part, like keeping the balance of both, like staying relevant, staying 
like tweeting a take on something just so that you can engage with your audience yeah. when you're dealing with like an anxiety attack. You know, that's the struggle. But then when you say to your audience, hey, I'm dealing with an anxiety attack, they're all like, oh my God, like, I understand, man. Like, keep your head up. Like, that's wonderful. I love that. I love, I love the fans. I love the support, all of that. So it's, it's a mixed bag, you know? Yeah, and it feels like, I, I'm always under the impression that there's like a fragility to it that I just can't ignore. That like, we live in this age where, yes, I, I think I've done a lot of things that people respond to, but it's like, you send one bad tweet, all of a sudden, all those people who are like, Hey man, I love you. We're going to say, you know what? I never liked him anyway. You know, he's just, yeah, exactly. he, he's, I, I, I never thought his stuff was that good. I mean, it's a weird kind of delicate balance uh, that you have. And you kind of brought up uh, it, it, your, you know, your, your future and, 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 you know, kind of where you're going from here and some of the content you're creating. And I, I'm, I'm curious about what your plans are. Cause it's obviously you want to be a film director. Uh, do you foresee a day in which you see yourself retiring from the essays about comic book films? Or do you kind of feel like that'll always be, a part of your content in some capacity. I feel like um, when I hopefully when and and if um, we're working on like a, a film with a budget, you know, whether it's for a studio or not, whether we right. kickstart, you know what I mean? I don't think I can, I don't, I physically don't think my mental state would survive if I'm shooting like a feature length film and making the videos. But I also think that I don't know if I'd ever stop, you know, if I really wanted to talk about Spider-Man two again, or mm -hmm. Sam Raimi again. Yeah. And I, even if we are making movies that people are seeing like that, I'd still do it. I think what would change would I, I probably wouldn't tweet like Chris Stuckman's doing. Love yeah, this. I was just about to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. With, with, what I, he's wouldn't, doing with that. yeah. I wouldn't talk about things I didn't like, you know, because that's mm -hmm. just when you're in the same field as someone, you don't want to be completely. And I always try to take stuff I don't like, as we've just talked about, from like a respectful, respect the artist perspective. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I don't even think I'd bother being like, oh, Titan season three is like breaking me every week. You know what I mean? Right, I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't even say that shit, you know, at that point. You know, I, I would guess I want to go back to, you know, some of the mental health stuff, because I, I think sure. that um, this probably doesn't happen as much with your short films, because those are more of a collaborative process. But with your video essays, you put so much time into them and it's it's all you. I mean, it's your it's your script. It's your editing. It's your content. Um, as rewarding as the final product may be. Is there a level of isolation that comes with that lack of camaraderie or do, oh. you, do you enjoy making it like a solo effort? Um, I, I'm very much like a control freak. I think in a lot of ways when it comes mm -hmm. to art. So I enjoy the element of writing it myself. I enjoy the element of like shaping it. Mm -hmm. But one thing that honestly is the worst, and I think like, I think everyone in the creative, you know, content field can understand this, but if you edit your own stuff, like if you're editing or listening back to what you just recorded, Mm -hmm. Sitting in alone in a room and listening to your own voice in the yeah. headphones on repeat, I swear to you, should be some form of torture. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. I, no, I feel you. I completely. Yeah. I'll record like the so like for the the Shang Chi video, the the I think the final runtime that's like eight minutes, right? But the the yeah. voiceover was like an hour, like the actual raw audio file of different takes. So like sitting there for like eight hours in a day, getting all the because you know I edit like a fucking. I'm on crack, you know, right. what I mean? like that. Yeah. But so sitting, hearing my voice just be like, uh, and I didn't like this movie, and I, I like this, and I didn't, and it's just like this loop mm -hmm. that is really, I think, takes a toll on my mental state. Um, but I, I do, I do find editing itself once I have the voice done, the voice part, that's therapeutic. That actually helps relieve mm -hmm. anxiety in a lot of ways for me. I don't know, maybe it's like the shaping things or the crafting of it, but that helps a lot with my anxiety in general. Editing, no. but especially for creators, there is something remarkably therapeutic about like, I put it on a page or I put it on the screen and now, now I can put it out to the world. But there is, you know, there is, I feel like a level of isolation that comes with being like, it's, it's all yours, you know? And, yeah. and you know, one last you know question I had about, you know, kind of in that, in that sphere, sure, um, you know, I, I'm under the impression that there's a lot of, there's a lot of tortured artists out there. And I feel like post COVID uh, or during COVID kind of made me realize that. And a big reason for it is I, I'm under the impression that incredible, sadness often leads to remarkable creativity. Like, I don't yes. know if you, I don't know if you had the ability to watch Bo Burnham's inside. On I haven't yet. I okay, haven't well, yet. It's, I'm not going to say it's the greatest stand-up special ever, but man, I appreciated it because it's, it's one guy over a time in which everyone was locked indoors, creating something that is, that is, you know, really, really remarkable. And even honestly, in my own life, I feel like some of the best content that I've created has come from times in which I've been my most anxious and my most depressed. Do you feel like you create better 
when you're not in the best headspace? Or do you feel like your best stuff comes from a time in which you're at your most present, you're at your most content and you're at your happiest? It's, it's really like screwed up to say, but I think that I kind of put myself usually in a down headspace in yeah. order to, to do the best creating. Like I'll, I'll think about things that if I'm trying to be happy, I wouldn't usually think about, you know, for example, like we just said, the Superman and Lois video, I think is one of my best. Yeah. And that is from a place of pure heartbreak and longing. You know what I mean? Like that, that, so yeah, I, I do think that for me, at least the, the sadness that we all feel and the isolation that we all feel and the anxiety that, you know, a lot of people are plagued with, that is great fuel to the fire of creativity. And I, I had a conversation with my buddy, Bailey, Loverboy Media. There's a plug. Um, he's great. But uh, about this, about how art, I think, is inherently a little bit self-destructive, just in general. Yeah. Like, it just is, you know, you like, you, you don't sleep you don't eat right you just keep like especially filmmaking you just go out there you express yourself and then you deal with people being like judging your form of self-expression you know yeah so it's super strange but and yeah where, i think that in general people respond to emotion people respond mm -hmm. to vulnerability i had a video that i made a couple like about two months ago um where i was not doing great and at, near the end of it i started to get a little bit emotional and I, when i uploaded it i'm like People are going to hate this. And the response to it was was overwhelming. And people being like, this is great. This is some of the best stuff you put out. I, I think that people people enjoy that vulnerability. They enjoy kind of coming, you know, coming back to that and seeing people be remarkably open. I mean, it's it's like that with athletes. Like no athlete prior to a game reads the positive press clippings. They they yeah. read the they they read the stuff from people who said that they suck and that they're not talented. And that's where they get their fuel from. That's where they get their motivation from. I feel like it's similar uh, with creators and, and people who who make content uh transitioning now to kind of some lighter stuff and, and this is this was a complete coincidence but i know you were and you me as well a massive fan of the ps4 spider-man game from oh yes oh, i would yes. I, and i dude i agreed with you i would say outside of the raimi films uh that is the closest we've gotten to a ripped straight from the comic put on the screen uh version of the character now last or yesterday they released the official trailer for um spider-man 2 you know the, the next game in 2023 i mean i saw you make a tweet that you know you're you're getting a little bit tired of venom which i am too in fairness but yeah just, what kind of like how, how excited are you for that I mean, uh well dude i just like i trust the insomniac guys and, and brian intahar and i think the other brian horton i think wait is that his name i hope so i hope so i hope so i can a i can adr it in case you got cool, it wrong cool yeah yeah, ADR <laughs> yeah. It real quick but whoever yeah. directed miles morales um yeah like both both of those game directors, the creative directors and and their whole writing team and and the music. And it's it's just, I have faith that no matter what they do, like I am like I just like you said, I am so sick to death of Venom, period. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm excited for Venom too. I'll see it, I'll enjoy myself, mm -hmm. you know. But like I am like I feel like he is such an overused Spider-Man villain. So like uh I, I'm not too excited about that, but like, hey, we got the Craven the Hunter voiceover in the trailer. I think I like the fact that I, I assume that Venom spoilers for the first game. I assume that Venom's going to be Harry, you know, you I would think, yeah, yeah I mean, they were, they were I, leading to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm excited to see what, what original story they tell, because I, what I love so much about PS4 is it's a very traditional thematically Spider-Man story that's told yeah. differently. Like, you know, Doc Ock's going to go bad, but the way they do it, like I said in the video, but like, you don't want him to, and the way they get you to feel emotion. And then when he does, it's tragic. So I'm very excited to see that kind of pathos that Insomniac likes to likes to shove into Spider-Man. Um, so I'm very excited. Yeah. yeah I, I wanted to go back to Venom for a second because I think that I've even felt this way since Spider-Man 3, honestly, that I don't think Venom, I think Marvel wants to make Venom the Joker to Spider-Man's Batman. But and he's I, not, man. You know no, he's, well, here's the problem with Venom is that Venom is a cool looking character. He looks great. Yeah. I mean, in, in, the design, it's the antithesis to Spider-Man. But Eddie Brock as a character is not a particularly deep or or like Doc Ock or or uh, Craven the Hunter or Norman Osborn. Those to me are like the prime example of like the real threatening Spider-Man villains. So I mean that's why when they announced that they were making a Venom solo film, I just said I just I just don't think it's that good because I just don't think Eddie Brock is that that deep of a character. Now Craven to me is the one that they. It's amazing to me Craven hasn't been done in live action yet because especially yeah. Cra Craven to me is to Spider-Man what Bane is to Batman. Like the one yeah. truly physically imposing. It's like, especially after Dark Knight Rises came out, I remember thinking, 
for Amazing Spider-Man two, they should do they should do Craven in part two because I that was like that's what Craven should be is this physically imposing, scary yeah. you know a uh, ver- you know villain that Spider-Man has to deal with. So I'm glad they're finally doing that you know, on, on PS4 or PS5 now, technically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, and I, you brought it up too that. Like I, uh, or in one of your previous videos, I've never been a huge miles Morales guy. Like I'm not against him as a character, but even yeah. spider verse when it came out, I'm like, okay, this is really good. It's a good, it's a good movie, but I'm not, I don't see miles Morales in the same vein as I see Peter Parker, the PS4 yeah. game. I was like, okay, I, I'm starting to see it now. They did a really good job and it's a short game. Part of me still feels like it could have been a DLC, but at the same time, it's a really well-made version of the character that expanded that universe and made me say, "Hey, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm excited for Far From Home or for No Way Home. I'm, I'm so tired of the fucking titles. Of the homes, home. yeah, the homes. But um, but uh, I, this, I'm, I'm more excited for what they're doing with with the video game universe. But because I'll be like, and I, I like the MCU version of Spider Man. I acknowledge wholly, and this is the problem that I think we run into on the internet is that people believe that to uh, it's a weakness to not acknowledge somebody's opinion. I acknowledge completely like everything that you've said in, in yeah, your videos. Yeah. I just, I just, I enjoy them for what they are. But the, the one problem I have with them is that they are um, the Raimi films and web films really felt like movies made by a filmmaker. Whereas yeah. the, uh, the Spider-Man MCU films are a cog in the MCU machine, which doesn't necessarily make them bad. But as a fan of that character who feels like that character should be more, um, it's always kind of bothered me. So I like, I like what they're doing with the, 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 the PlayStation games. I think that's well, great. I think what, um, real quick, if I can go on a little, no, go ahead. I have had it, man. Yeah. I, I feel like what, um, the reason why the game feels so much more like Spider-Man, I think mm-hmm. outside of just like the being broke and you see him have to pay rent, like right. all that stuff. But, um, I think it's just the, the, like you said, the MCU movies, don't have that operatic grand emotional feel that even like amazing too, which is very, you know, I'm, I'm making a video on that now. So hopefully it lives up to the first. I I defend it way more than I should. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I I acknowledge heavy flaws. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But like I, even that movie like feels so emotional and big and the action's huge and it's not like, you know, and for me, it's like, I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's John Watts's inexperience with bigger movies. You know what I mean? I mean, Mark mm-hmm. Webb also was inexperienced with like the big, big movies. But with like Raimi, it's really hard to top a guy who had like, I think, 11 movies under his right. belt before he did Spider-Man one. You know, so like to me, I'm still trying to chase the high of the grand spectacle feel of like the 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 Harry Peter fight in Spider-Man three, where they're just like zooming through New York. Like yeah. I, I'm chasing that high of the, the, the grand kind of like, you feel like small and you're looking up at Spider-Man. And one yeah. thing that the MCU does that I never was, um, I, I like one of my issues with it, which is, you know, my personal thing, I'm jealous of people like it, but yeah. I, I hate how they always try to minimize Peter Parker. They try to make him feel so young and like a kid and they shoot him visually in a way where he's like small and not heroic and not a man yet not like a full grown hero which i'm just against that kind of thing because i love the idea of this kid forced to stand up tall you know yeah for forced to be that the the one thing i the one thing i legitimately and i again i I like what they did with the mcu i think it's fine the one thing i do legitimately hate is i hate the cinematography of the swinging sequences like Mm -hmm. i think the the is the CG dated in the Raimi films? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's 2002 and 2004, but there was a weight to the, to the way those were shot. And a big reason for it is, I mean, I don't think there's ever been a better score than what Danny Elfman did. For oh, yeah. oh I, yeah. I, I just, I, and a, that, that's a big, big reason for that. I mean, it just captures, you hear it and you just visualize Spider-Man. Cl- you get the goosebumps, the hair. Yeah, no, for it's sure. Head. And yeah. it's like, no way home to me will be like, I will give it a pass if they, if they find a way to shoehorn that theme into it. I think but, even um, I will, I will, I will like yeah. fanboy if I hear that. Right. But, but even, but even with the web films, like yes, uh, amazing Spider-Man one for whatever reason, really kind of until the crane scene kind of went out of its way to show a lot of swinging stuff. But even in two, uh, I mean the, the, the visual way that they show him swinging through the city, I thought was just, it takes your breath away. And now yeah. it's like, now it's just like there. And, and I think Marvel's idea, their belief is like, well, people have seen that it's gotten old. It has it to me, like to me, same. like it's the same, it's the same way with like seeing Superman fly where it's like, and, and that's where I give, and I don't like the Snyder verse at all, but that's where I give Zack Snyder credit is like at the very least in man of steel, 
um, they the way they film the Superman flying sequences really oh, yeah. did ha- have a visual emotion to them and a visual flair to them that was different enough from what we'd seen with Christopher Reeve and what we'd seen uh, with Brandon Routh. And, and that kind of actually that it's kind of a perfect transition into, into my last question here, because um, ending on a bit of a lighter note about a movie that I'm really excited to see. I'll be honest, I am as excited for Matt Reeves, the Batman Oh, as I've yeah. been for any movie, probably since Star Wars, The Force Awakens, to be honest. I, yeah. I just, and a big reason for that uh, is because I think it's a perfect director attached. All, I mean, I think the the Planet of the Apes trilogy that came out 2011 to 2017, oh, it's beautiful. especially his two, I would say is the best series of Hollywood films or one of the best, probably in the last 30, 40 years, honestly. Yeah. Like, I, cause no. I, and there's a famous right. story, and I don't know, I think it's true that he kind of saved that, that when after Rupert Wyatt did a great job with the first one. But there's that kind of story about they wanted to make a sequel about James Franco's character. And Matt Reeves came in and said, guys, what are you doing? I mean, that we got a character here in Caesar who is like a larger than life. Great. That's who you build the series on. And I felt watching them recently, I am blown away by for movies that came out in 2014 and 2017. They're fucking dour. And they're yeah. like they're they're really quiet movies. I mean, there's a long sequences of very little dialogue and they made. 500 to 700 million uh, worldwide. I think it's a perfect director. You're very keen and always have been about films having a real directorial stamp. And the one thing about DC, love them or hate them, and sometimes it doesn't work, they really give their directors carte blanche to kind of make whatever they want. I mean, that's where, like, you really liked Birds of Prey. I did too, because I felt like Kathy Yan for a basically first-time director, they gave her a $150 million movie. And um, I love the way that movie looks. It's one of my favorite yeah. looks of Gotham City. So, I mean, just kind of like how excited are you for for, for that movie and, and oh. how you think it's going to turn out? You have you have no idea, dude. I am – I am that – I watch that trailer way too much. Same just, dude every day, man. <laughs> Same here, bro. <laughs> just, just from the trailer. Like, I am so – hyper you know not critical but hyper like fixated on like seeing batman that i know perfectly translated Mm -hmm. and just the just that trailer and the line like i'm vengeance and like his one line that like gets me the goosebumps when he's like how am i a part of this like just that i'm already like pattinson's the best batman this movie's gonna be amazing like like yeah i i like you said the, the the best thing about those ape movies that that reeves made or the fact you got a movie called War, I think is the last one, right? War. And it's really just like a quiet, fucking horrible, bleak, like, you There's know. There's literal Holocaust imagery, like for a yeah. large majority of that movie. Yeah. A $200 and, million dollar movie, that's really ballsy. Yeah. And it's just this slow, you know, like Western almost of just like torture and, and, and you know, hope in the middle of that. And that's so... Like uh, Matt Reeves, there's not a there's not a better filmmaker after making that that last Apes movie to do like a story about a tortured fucking soul like Batman. Yeah. You know, I'm with you. I, and honestly, like I I contend, I think that trailer they again during the heart of COVID, but I think is one of the best movie trailers of all time. Just in it terms really of is. in terms of selling everything it needs to sell, because I never had any doubt Pattinson wouldn't be a good Batman. But that moment in the trailer of him breaking every bone in that guy's face and then dropping the I'm vengeance, it's like. Everyone unanimously was like, oh, yeah, he'll be good. And I think it's been a long time to me since casting has been as perfect as Paul Dano as the Riddler. Like, oh, I yeah. think that especially you played the Arkham games, right? I know you made yeah. a video about Arkham Origins, but like the one thing about that they did right with the Riddler in those games is he's just a fucking pest. He's just a smarmy like. And the one thing about Paul Dano, great actor. I mean, incredible. Oh, actor. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen There Will Be Blood, I mean, he matches Daniel Day-Lewis like beat for beat. Yeah, he, he always just looks moist. And just always just like, he's just one of those guys who just looks slimy. And I think for casting of the Riddler, I, I think that's going to be perfect. And I can't, I can't wait to see, you know, how they portray that um, in, in live action. And like, yeah, I think they got the perfect director attached and it's too bad. It keeps getting moved back, but I really, I really think they're going to do something special with, it. I mean, do you kind of the follow up to that? Do you have any interest in seeing that be connected to another universe? Or do you want to see that same here? I'm, I'm with, and I think no way. in fairness, I think that's what they're doing. And I don't know if that was the original intent necessarily, but I think with Flashpoint, especially following the success, relative success of the Snyder Cut, um, I think they're trying to kind of connect things to that universe still. I think the Batman is wholly its own thing. And it's the one thing about, it's why to me, uh, the the Nolan films are still the best like comic book movies ever is that they were not bogged down by any of that. I mean, Nolan no. made went one movie at a time and made what he wanted to make. So, I mean, do you have any interest in seeing uh, Batman be connected to Superman again, at least in that universe, or do you just want to see the, Matt Reeves' vision? 
the, I, I just want to see the vision. That's, that's yeah. mainly the main thing, but the only thing that I'd be super down for is um whatever, whatever they do, they're doing a reboot with Superman right now. I think they're doing like three different ones. You know, no, there's like the one on they've announced. It's it's like the Quentin yeah. Tarantino of comic book movies where they just had yeah. ideas being thrown out there. I don't know how many of them are going to land, but yeah. I would love to see uh, my dream movie period is like a duet piece between Batman and Superman. And so like if they if they whatever they do with Superman, if they reboot it and they take like the I, I don't know what the budget for the Batman is, but I assume it's lower than the standard like giant you know marvel movie you know i think I mean, it's I, gotta I, be yeah i mean it's it's less grand probably than those i could i don't know if it's available publicly but i can check yeah yeah um 100 100, 100 million which is yeah. by by hollywood standards is very little man yeah. especially nowadays yeah and you can kind of tell in the trailer that they're really focused on like doing grounded tight shots you know what i mean that aren't like these big big sweeping like it's all gritty and, and almost like shot like a horror movie you know which i love yeah. but um, I, I'd be really interested to see a new Superman with Pattinson Batman, just a new Superman that has, but this Superman's also standalone and don't set up for a justice league. The only thing I'd be cool with basically is what I'm saying is that they make a really good Superman movie. Like Batman's probably going to be really good. And we got like a little duet piece between the two, but I would never, I cannot fathom Pattinson Batman being just from the trailer, being in a justice league, you know, with Jason Momoa Aquaman being like, all right. And then meanwhile, you have like this tortured, you know, like. No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you completely. And I, I did not. And again, I'm not a fan of the Snyderverse and I'm very much not a fan of Batman versus Superman. I think that like that movie in many ways felt like a troll piece to me where it's like, I, give me everything you want to see out of a Batman and Superman movie. And they kind of did the opposite. I mean, yeah. for one, the entire thing could have been Shakespeare and Batman shooting people with guns. Just, I, I just can't connect with, but yeah. I'm with you where I do think, I think the thing is about those characters that you got to get right is the differing ideologies. And the problem is there was too much of a mesh between mm -hmm. like both of them were out murdering people and trying to, you know, it just, it didn't work for me. I respect Zack Snyder a ton as a filmmaker. Like he's not, you know, people, people try to, he's not fucking Uwe Boll. You know, he's a guy with a real vision. Yeah. It's a vision. And that's why I thought your, your video about the Zack Snyder justice league was perfect where, yeah. I mean like the final moment of Batman just saying to the Joker, I'm going to fucking kill you to me. I view as like a complete polar opposite of what I believe the Batman character to be. Same, same. Um, yeah. But it's his. It is, yeah. and, and and I think for for and that's why I support it as much as I did not like Batman for Superman. I supported his Justice League getting made, uh, because at least it it was you know it was very much his own vision, and I think that's important. So, um, man, you know, I said it beforehand, but I I love what you do, Thank and you. I think that you 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 create incredible stuff uh, on YouTube. And uh, I will, I will support whatever you do going forward and, and promote whatever you do going forward. So thank you for being part of this, man. And of course, um, dude. yeah, thank uh, everyone. Follow them. I'll link to everything. High top films uh, on YouTube, putting out content all the time. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate you joining me, dude. Anytime. Yep. Thank you.